So, um, good afternoon. Um, happy e uh, solar eclipse day, I guess, uh, for yeah. this year anyway. Um, welcome to Monday Live. This is something that we do every Monday afternoon, even when there is no eclipse, uh, to uh, <laughs> figure out what the future is for, for smarter buildings. So, uh, welcome. It's great uh, uh, that you're here with us. Um, we are listed on mondaylive.org, just in case you're wondering who we are. Um, and uh, I do want to make an a, a, a important point here that views expressed here are personal, not of any company or organization. Um, please do post comments and uh, questions on the Zoom chat so that we can make this as interactive as possible. Um, so welcome. Um, so the, um, the topic uh, for this month uh, of April is artificial intelligence, AI. So we're going to be digging into that and uh, our agenda for today, our normal chit chat for a little bit. And then we're going to be um, talking uh, talking with a number of AI vendors that are going to come uh, come and join us as, as, uh, as guests. Um, really just having a, a conversation about um, trying to sort of um, understand where this, the state of play is right now with AI vendors in, in the building space. So really looking forward to that. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, this is part of a series of three months that we started back in February talking about OT. That was really a very uh, interesting month that then morphed into a discussion about IoT, um, which has sort of led us uh, to this month talking about AI. So this kind of a progression that we think is uh, meaningful because of just uh, uh, all of these things are sort of evolving right now very, very rapidly. Um, before we get into the uh, conversation, hand it over to Ken for an update. Thanks, Anto. Uh, okay, tomorrow is IoT Day, and uh, that's the day you're supposed to just meet with somebody for coffee and just chat a little bit about what how IoT has changed our life. And uh, we've submitted uh, our last month as a, an example of IoT. They had IO day, IOT day, we have IOT month. So uh, uh, that'll be event. I see that uh, Suha has got a, uh, a gathering of a bunch of IOT, strong IOT uh, women in our industry as well as one of the events. So that's going on tomorrow. Uh, go, go to hashtag IOT day and see what's happening there. Uh, down below, I've got that interesting looking graphic, and if you click on it, it leads you to a post about some folks that are starting to chat about uh, what AI might mean to personalize music, and that kind of caught my attention, because once I started thinking about that, uh, some of the things that they were considering for personalized music could probably have the effect of human comfort, so... Uh, uh, it's always interesting. I always find that when technologies get applied, uh, the way people apply them always surprise us and we learn so much from other technologies. So I think that's something worth watching. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I saw this nice graphic on the AI graphic right in the middle of the screen on Facebook. And we kind of, we tend to all be, uh, LinkedIn folks, but uh, as automated buildings, we we push out to uh, X, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Pinterest, and, and anything anywhere else, uh, in, uh, Instagram. And uh, I caught this graphic uh, posted by uh, Realcom, and it's actually a part of a slide presentation on uh, Facebook. So we kind of forget some of these other mediums, but... Uh, uh, we're a media sponsor of Realcom, so I was kind of following that. Uh, the other thing that's going on is they have this Buildings AI Symposium. So if you actually look at the uh, uh, programming for IBCon and Realcom, you'll see that probably, I would say, 50% of everything they're talking about has AI in it. So I think it's very timely that Monday Live uh, is... is focused on uh, AI for the month of April. It's a nice uh, nice lead in. So good timing, Nanto. Well done. Back to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Uh, indeed, a lot of things going on. Uh, so I, I 
as far as my slide, I, I put up this slide. Uh, just obviously, we're in the middle of the eclipse. I'm just looking out the window here. It's starting to get dark here. I think the eclipse is about as close to me as it's ever going to get. So I'm not going to get 100% uh, where I am in Asheville. Um, but sort of just sort of reflecting back on um, the eclipse, obviously, this has been going on for uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years, probably much more than that. And since we're talking about AI, I kind of just wonder whether AI down the road is going to be um, bemused by this this uh, natural occurrence, or whether it's just to them it's just a mathematical sort of equation that just happens to be these three celestial bodies just happen to be in a line. So what? So I was just sort of thinking out of crazy thoughts this morning. Well, you know, it's already mined all the data for all the solar eclipses that have ever happened. So I think it's probably aware already. <laughs> yeah, but and then what? I mean, what what does it what does AI do with a solar eclipse? Well, if it's if it's smart and it gets dark, it'll probably rob all our houses. <laughs> <laughs> and time it perfectly. All right. Anyway, <laughs> amusing. Amusing thoughts. Um, I our normal link board uh, with various links. Uh, any other thoughts? Anybody want to bring up before we dive in? Mm -hmm. um, hearing nothing, so let's uh, dig into artificial intelligence and um, uh, vendors in the space. I am going to um, uh, in, and I'm going to bring on to the panel a num number of people here from the audience. I see David Hipkamp is there. I see Keith Gibson is there. And Al, I think, is also under Rick Justice, right, Rick? I think I, I forwarded him my invitation. So yeah, that's probably Al. Okay, I can change his name. that and with a bit of luck should all be here we all here al is here david is here and keith where's keith you get lost up to keith try again with keith All right. So, um, hello, David. Hello, Al, and hello, Keith. Um, maybe we can just um, uh, spend uh, a, a few seconds each with uh, some brief introductions uh, for those that don't know you. Um, David, I'm just going to go uh, starting with you. Uh, just a brief intro: what 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 you're doing and who who you are and who you, who sure. you're with, etc. Yeah. Can do. I'm David Knifkamp. I'm the CEO and president of uh, Smart Controls. Uh, we design, manufacture, and build building automation controls, uh, commercial building automation controls. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been doing this since about 1993, uh, when it first started with LawnWorks. Uh, since then, we've gotten into BACnet, Modbus, and of course, doing things over TCP IP and today getting into the RF world. Um, the main thing we do is we build controllers. So we're at that low level where the rubber meets the road. Uh, we're touching the temperature, humidity, CO2, DOC, and then taking that data and sending it back uh, to, be, to our controllers to perform some kind of action. But today's world, obviously, now we want to be able to send that data out to the cloud so that AI type devices and mechanisms can use that data to uh, provide control functions, to uh, provide more efficiency, uh, more energy uh, usage, or less energy usage, things like that. But where we're kind of spinning some things is that we also have some graphical programming software called Visual Control. So part of our game is not only to get that data to the cloud, but to say how much of that AI functionality can we do in a graphical programming environment? And that's where we're at today. And I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, David. We'll, we'll dig into some of those elements later, uh, but uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, Keith, you're up next on my, on my screen. Welcome back to Monday Live. Everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Uh, yeah. Great to be here. 
Um, very excited to talk about AI as always. Um, so we, I'm, I'm the CEO of Facil.ai. We, uh, you know, bring AI to the table to make buildings operate better. I always say we're pretty much, uh, you know, going at it from an, an autonomous standpoint. So our system, our, our, our system is based in the cloud. It's got a touch point down to the individual locations to the existing building control systems through our software software gateway technology. And yeah, we just want to kind of run in the background autonomously and just make the buildings and the control systems more efficient. Um, there's lots of, you know, talk about, you know, about whether or not that can be done on a legacy uh, control system. Um, I mean, I'm sitting at Cal State Dominguez Hills here on the, on the 1993 Johnson control system that I used to work on actually. So I used to be the tech out here. And yeah, we're uh, having great success on the central plant optimization out here, reducing their energy by about 38% um, and increasing their chill water flow. So uh, having great results. And uh, yeah, can't wait to have a chance to uh, demo, demonstrate our system. Great uh, good to have you with us uh, today, Keith. Um, Al, um, good to have you uh, uh, with us today. How are you doing? Could you do a bit of an intro? Good to see you again. Thanks, Anto, and yeah, thanks everyone for your time. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, Al Zurichowski here with uh, with Shift Energy, um, courtesy of Rick Justice. Thanks, Rick. Uh, I'm a senior VP here at Shift, responsible for our, our product and also our, our business development. Uh, if you have not heard of Shift, uh, we've been in this uh, industry for probably about 10 years now. Our, our focus and our core value prop is around uh, energy efficiency of large buildings. We we work with uh, uh, a couple of REITs. We're Canadian based. A couple of REITs here uh, in Canada, and and uh, our our market is you know typically large uh, office buildings, uh, university campuses, and in hospitals. Um, we've uh, to date we've been. And then the and the company's uh, history has been what I call in the air side of the building where we're doing uh, energy optimization, but we've the last couple of years we've been doub doubling down on machine learning. So we're we're really invested in the central plant in particular, uh, chilled water plant. And I'd be happy to say more about that, Anto, when we're ready. Great, great, thank you, Al. Uh, great to have you uh, with us here. So. We have a number of questions that we want to sort of um, frame this conversation around, and so I'm, I'm just going to put them up for a bit, and then we can uh, we can go from there. Um, the the first one is really just to the, sort of to loosen us up a little bit, um, and just to get our opinions. Um, how many AIs will there be? Do you think in a typical building? Let's say a couple of decades down the road. How many, as in a discrete count? How many? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the reason for asking this question is just trying to get us nature of what is the a, what is AI? Is this something that there is only one of, or is it hundreds or thousands? What 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 is our thoughts on that? And, and when you say in a building, you mean a commercial building, like yes. I mean, not imagine like a twin, twenty story building downtown somewhere, kind of a thing. So, oh, you took uh, until you're talking about applications or, or models of or. Anything that we would consider an AI? I'll, I'll take that one. I mean, we, we actually price our AI according to that, so a, a model. So we pretty much have one of our large retail customers. They have 1,400 buildings. They've got 4,500 rooftop units, simple RTUs, 10 to 40 tons each. Uh, yeah, and we price it by the number of uh, RTUs they have. So there's a it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, it's one bot per RTU, and that thing, each bot just camps out on RTU number 2,700 or whatever, and it optimizes the heck out of that one piece of equipment. And on the central plant side, we, we also price it. Now that, we, we price according to the equipment as well, um, and it's number of machines, uh, because these things are like snowflakes. So we have three identical, air quotes intended, like identical chillers here at Cal State Dominguez Hills. And we all know here at the shop that chiller number two doesn't run exactly the same way as chiller number three or number one for that matter. So each individual piece of equipment, we price it that way, we deploy it that way, um, and it's optimized in that fashion. So I hope that helps. 
So Anto, so the question I have, so to your to your question, and I think Roger, you might have been kind of going this way. So I have a building, whatever, twenty floors, whatever you, whatever it is. Do I have one AI instance or application that does what Keith does, as an example? Oh well, I also want to do this. Is that another AI application? And I've got something else. Is that another AI? That's that was that was exactly the framing. No, I exactly. I got it. Yeah, no, exactly. And then is that if there are multiple AIs in a building, is the challenge is what we've experienced for the last 20, 25 years is the interoperability of those a of those different AIs. Is that kind of where you were going? Yeah. Okay. And, and you know, so to, to to go back to Keith, I mean, you describe what what uh, you, you, how you do things, right? And you know, part of my question is that do you consider that one AI a single AI system? And probably the answer is yes. Yes. But you 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 price it by RTUs or what the pieces. I get that, but it's really all connected as a as as one AI in the in in the in, in that context. Well, so it's 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 really like a it's a subscription basis as far as how many they pay, but the it's transactional, right? I mean, they don't like we're on the Azure cloud, so there we don't even have the concept of like a server or an application. Like they're just resource groups, so we just run pieces of code on right. some resource, massive resource out there in the cloud that we don't even know how it, what the configuration is. So yeah, that's the way it runs. It's, it's just cycles, cycles per second. So does it come back to that question we're always asking ourselves is do we have one data lake and everybody pulls out of it? Um, and then you know who owns that data is the question quite often comes up. I mean, how how is yeah, this all going to work as we go on? Otherwise we'll have all sorts of people sort of diving in with their own, you know, Maybe Al with his chillers and you with the rooftops and somebody else with different parts. I guess it's how's all that going to work? Well, we have our own SQL Server instance, so there's one there's one SQL Server instance with a bunch of tables in it. But we make that data available on that SQL Server, for that matter, to our customers as part of our engagement, so they can query against it, do whatever they want to, you know, against that table. It's, it's their data. I mean, I get to ask that question, like whose data is it? Like, yes, yeah, the customer. Mm -hmm. Oh, they automatically okay. get all that stuff. Um, Al, do you want to chime in on, on this? It's I, mean, I know it's a little bit of an abstract question to kick us off. <laughs> my Most of my career has been in the software development. So my view of this world is, now you said in the next two or three decades, but let's just dial it back, say, to the next decade. My My view of this world is, Every application that's in the building uh, at some point is going to have AI technology in it. And I view, in my opinion, they're all going to be disparate on, on day one. Everyone's going to build their own application around their own technology and their own methodology and development uh, around AI. I think your question's provocative, though. Uh, you know, what's how's that going to look in 20 or 30 years, right? Are, are vendors going to be sharing their data? I mean, I... This is the first time I've been on Monday Live, but I, in talking to Rick, I understand the uh, it's kind of the 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 direction that this forum is going in. But all the people who are not on this call, you know, are they going to want to share their data uh, and share their methodology? You know, will the, will the big, you know, large strategics uh, want to do that over time? I mean, that's always the technology tension between the the commercial and the technology. But as I said, I I I think in the short term we're going to have. Lots and lots of applications, all with their own view of AI and the interoperability with it and the sharing of data. I, in my opinion, that that's the hard commercial business part that's that's going to take time. Which is what we want to um, get Overcome. into, which is great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, D David, I mean, this this has a this question actually has a slightly different um, sort of spin on it for you, right? In in what you're trying to do to put AI in those controllers that you sell, which means that it can't be one. It must be on the other side of it, right? With some zeros in it. Right. Um, I like the model that's being produced today. That's good. Where we see things going basically is that um, the numbers, whatever you want it to be, uh, is the bottom line. The reason being is if you look at your body, how many sensors do you have in your body? I don't know. 
but does your brain monitor every piece of data point coming from your fingernail? No. So what happens is your fingernail, your finger says to the brain, something's bad, it hurts, I don't like it, it's too hot, I burn myself. It sends that data and then everything responds after that. And that's the way we look at a building. Um, there's probably any number of devices that have AI capability of building to do enormous, enormous amount of functionality from preventive maintenance, energy optimization, uh, occupancy detection, uh, anomaly detection, I can go on and on for about four more or five more items. So each item then is taking on its own responsibility. Yet with each device, it creates a collective intelligence for the building. Does that form one AI? Kind of, sort of, because now the building becomes an AI itself by having this collective intelligence. And therefore now you ask the question, will it share data? Why? Why do I need to share the data? Unless I need to. It's just like everyone on this panel here. Does everyone share their data, who they are, what they are, how they work, what they like, what's their favorite movies, what's mm. their favorite ice cream? No, I, I don't know unless I ask. So basically, it's the same with the building. Unless you ask for it and want to know something about it, it runs on its own. Just like every person on this panel can run on their own, they're intelligent on their own basis, and they could do things autonomously. And that's where the building is going to basically be. That's where we see a building going, is that the building will have its own virtual intelligence. If you want to know something about it, ask, no big deal. If you want to uh, connect it with other things so that you know two devices can work more harmoniously together because you have multiple buildings, you want to compare. Well, it's like having a bunch of people in a, in, a, in a room and you start asking, okay, what do you want to do? Who are you? Why are we all here? What do we want to achieve together? And that's the same thing that goes on then with the, with the AI and the buildings, having multiple buildings. So you have your, your small buildings, your medium-sized buildings, and your individual buildings that are fundamentally would be running more autonomous because they have their own virtual functionality to understand how to do all these things that go on in a building. It's not just heating and cooling and energy efficiency. That's just one thing. And they're, they're objects. Like, they're objects. Like, that's, that's object-oriented design. That's encapsulation of functionality. Like, yes, it's exactly our system is actually built in that fashion. They're all objects. They and the, the analogy, obviously, to, to the body, the human body, is, is great because then you, have, you, you, you can then ask the same question, how many AIs is there in a typical body? And there's, there's 10 of us here, right? Same, same kind of question, right? And it's somewhat impossible to answer, right? Because I would say there's only one me, there's only one Anto, but... Guess what? Everybody doesn't have to be the same blood type either to exist. Exactly. So there's just to extend David's point though, one of the reasons I asked the question, Anto, is you gotta remember there are gonna be many, many more systems in the building outside of HVAC, yep. right? Tenant management, uh, yep. signage, uh, lighting, you know, um, there are so many other tenant focused applications that got nothing to do with the controls. Yep. You know, occupancy analysis is all gonna be AI driven. You know that that that's gonna just you know double or triple the number of separate AI systems. I like, but one of the things I like about David's comment, by the way, which caused me to pause and think for a sec, will this actually change the way that we actually do integration in the future? Right at the moment, we're all focused in on protocols and low-level APIs, and you know, doing data mapping and all that sort of stuff. When you think about it from a AI or a chat or a large language model type initiatives, is it simpler for my system to just ask David systems, you know, tell me the number of RTUs op in operation today? Um, do I actually, yeah. need, do I need to have any protocols anymore? Do I just ask it by through large language models? That's kind of interesting. For the, for the systems to be able to yeah. talk to each other, yeah. for the site, for, in, this was the conversation last month, right? In the yeah. I, IoT. Right. It was all about silos, right? And really what we're talking about here is that the sort of this sort of concept of silos is not a million miles away from what we're talking about here. Each each AI will effectively be in a silo. And what we're talking about is being able to have these silos be bridged by some, by data that can move. But, but that's them. my point though, is that bridging now may actually be potentially becomes a lot simpler, right? If yeah. I just send a normal text request as opposed to some convoluted backnet protocol yes because it's, it's action oriented i need to do this or right, right. yeah
So let's let's dive into the second bullet here, which is um, I think um, the most important bullet out of this list here um, is the the whole sort of relationship between da data and AI. Um, and it's obviously important. The relationship is important, and that that sort of the thread that's been going on on, on Monday Live the past few weeks is really about that, uh, but about is that issue really understood by by customers and by people in this industry? Is the fact that AI is really needing data for it to operate? Is that concept um, um, sort of settled in everybody's mind? So I don't know who wants to jump in first. I can jump into that one real fast. Um, if you don't have data, you don't have AI, you have automation. So from a very fundamental perspective, um, AI is all about data and how you use it. If you don't add data to the equation, you're fundamentally saying automation. And we have automation today. So uh, when I hear the word AI, I want to make sure that um, there's a major, major data component there that adds to that intelligence. Otherwise, I'm simply doing automation. So that's kind of the, the basis where I start when I hear the word AI. So, uh, so question on this. So obviously, I think most everybody on this call will agree the importance of data and its relationship to AI. As AI uh, developers, folks that have AI out there, are you doing anything different for security and data privacy than you would do normal building automation, integration, whatever? We all know privacy and cyber are extremely important, but is there things that you have to do differently? Uh, now that you're running a native, you know, using modern IT protocols and web services. Okay. I mean, I have to drop down to the backnet over IP layer as an implementation detail on the other side of a software gateway, but that's necessary. Um, so yeah, as long as the top side is secure, and I mean, it is, I mean, we're not, we're based on Microsoft Azure, by the, for example. I mean, we're not rolling our own security or doing anything like that. So we're just kind of riding on top of that. Mark, you have a good question here because I, I think what uh, Keith just said there, yes, at the um, physical and link layer, absolutely. I think a lot of good data security, things like that. Where the challenge comes in, we get to the application there because we've seen with the um, some of the other models, you can get biased data, okay? Yeah. I didn't say incorrect, it's just biased because the information that fed it is not accurate. So that's where the trust factor comes in with the data is do we trust the data? What is that data? And that develops a trust factor with that data. So that's where we have to watch out. What's an example of that in building automation? I've seen it. Um, people have walked up to CO2 sensors and they breathe on them. Well, that's throwing a lot of CO2 at it. <laughs> I see thermostats where they've taken big lighters and they hold their big lighter underneath it. Yes, they burn the plastic but they're faking out the system. So that's bad data. You know, if I was monitoring them, I'd say it's bad data. And I can filter that out. But again, the concern is at the application level, when we're really doing good AI and it's become, it's learning from that data that we don't get biased information. And that's one of the tricks we have to look at as a developer to make sure that we have good data and it's trustworthy. And yes, Mark, uh, as you get into, is there security associated with that so that, you know, it can't be corrupt or someone putting in bad data. So Scott, but, but, Scott, Scott DeWitt just made a very um, compelling uh, post uh, message. He said there's training data and there's real-time operational data. And I mean, I was just about to expand upon that. So everybody, talk, we're talking about data and specifically where a lot of folks like to talk about physics. What kind of physics and data are you talking about? Are you talking about a, a theoretical physics? which where you're trying to do a prediction. So most AI, and I think this is a big reason why AI people are struggling, vendors are struggling and everybody's struggling in the controls industry. This is not a prediction problem. This is not a data prediction problem. So this is not like showing AI a thousand cats and a thousand dogs and saying, okay, what is this? That's a prediction problem. Text to speech, uh, speech to text. That's, those are prediction problems. We got real-time control issues here. 
Okay, so we don't have time for a human being to sit here and label the control of a, of a pit loop and the output in real time. Um, and that's where the problem comes. So we're talking about physics, yes, but we're talking about experimental physics. And so you have to, the big problem with the, and that I've learned in applying AI to control is how do you align, how do you line up your training data with your real-time operational data? And the only way I see to do that is what we're doing, and we call it AI imitation learning. And I guess that kind of jumps ahead of where you know our AI fits in the in the what type of AI. It's under reinforcement learning, which is under machine learning, and it's specifically it's called imitation learning, where we look at the human experts that control the central plant, for example, and it mimics their behavior. This is a similar idea with Tesla, by the way, with their new release. So their new release, um, they 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 learned they have millions of miles of training data, of, of, of training data. So they got rid of their 30 million lines of control, control procedural code in C++. And they said, we got millions of miles of training data and telemetry from the Tesla. So let's just show the AI millions of miles of driving. And that's why their new version, FSD version 12 is, is so significant right now because it totally just reinvented the way that you engage in a real control problem, which is the same exact thing we're doing and have to do. You're, Keith, you're talking about two things here. One is control and one is predictive maintenance. When you get into predictive maintenance- I'm not talking about predictive maintenance. I'm talking about predictive uh, predictive um, AI. Most machine learning problems is a prediction issue. So like you're trying to predict what what something is, a picture of a cat or whatever. Yeah, that not so in, contr in control. You can't really run this digital twin on the side because your your outcome is only and your outputs are only going to be as accurate as your model and it's like trying to it's like trying to model a tornado right you, know, you can't how can you model a tornado so you got to actually experiment on the real thing to get an accurate model and then you have alignment and you don't you don't have that problem of divergence yeah i just be careful that predict because we've had some of those logics where in a building, there was a bad data connection. And what was determined was it always happened when it rained outside. So the predictive model said, well, the problem with the connection is humidity when it rains. That had nothing to do with it, which is <laughs> a bad connection on a wire. And uh, humidity had nothing to do with it and rain had nothing to do with it. So that was, that's one of a little example of bias in data because it made a connection with an event that really had nothing to do with the problem. And yeah. uh, so we have to watch out. If you add more information into the model to make it more accurate, that information can be misleading to the AI model, and that's where we have to be very careful when we say about trusting data. Absolutely. If if you didn't if you didn't do like a, like you do in a meter reading system, if you didn't filter out bad data, like there's a res, you know you have a resolution, there's a tolerance. So yeah, we just our AI just ignores bad data like that, and it doesn't need. It doesn't need, it only needs about 80 to 85% data quality to be quite effective, which falls right in the realm of most building control systems because most building control systems, trust me, I had 16,000 buildings connected together at my last company and the best we could do is 85% data quality. And that's that's pretty darn good. That's good enough for an AI system or, or a remote control system. It doesn't have to be perfect. But that's that's something, Keith, that's always fascinates me when people talk about AI, about, well, you know, we can get the odd case wrong because we've got bad data. And, you know, and I know how many terrible technicians we have out there who make wrong judgments just as humans, right? How many times <laughs> has someone, has one of your, your technicians... Bias is showing. <laughs> come <laughs> back, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I remember I was like, literally having this argument with a former partner of mine, and we were having the argument over a cell phone. It's like, we're not going to be able to do this unless we have perfect... Hello? Hello? <laughs> and then I called them back. I want to identify the, 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 you know, male or female. And I'm like, hey, you know, uh, I guess we need to trash our whole company because and throw you should throw your cell phone away because we just dropped a call. Can't use this thing unless it's got perfect cellular. Uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> which which makes me laugh. And yeah. And use like, what yeah. Our technicians in the world, and we've got less and less good ones. That that's part of the challenge we're trying to solve here with 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 a lot of this building. Yeah, hey, our resolution on our central plant control is every five minutes. Yeah. Okay, so we don't need data for 100% data quality every 10 seconds. As long as I get a reading in five minutes, and even if I don't get it then, which is highly unlikely, okay, 
but let's wait another five minutes. Right. In the worst case, you're going to go right back to the little Commodore 64 on the wall controlling your children. So I guess not. Come on. We're, we're raising the bar up to unreasonable levels that they don't have to be. Isn't that, isn't that different for Al with his chillers? Because if a chiller fails, don't you need to know at that instant with everything that was going on at that moment as opposed to just random sampling times? So um, we're not you, have that, you have that today, Roger? Do you know, tell me one system that gives me that today. <laughs> There are systems that got it out there. We'd have to do that. We're, not trying, to, we're not trying to optimize for the 10% the failure of the children. We're trying to optimize for the 90% operational time. So we complete, that's another point. We don't look at faults. So we've got a portfolio of one of my retail customers. They got 4,500 RTUs. We can't talk to 15% of them at any one time. And what do we do? We totally ignore them. But I guess, Keith, when there is a failure, you know, the op you know, optimize, minimizing downtime and optimizing your use of staff become quite important in knowing you know, why that chiller um, did not, not in our world. Um, we're, at, we're actually on the 75% of the time. So yeah, we don't, like we don't look at faults. That's for other folks. And, and other that's, I guess, where the difference is and goes back to Anto's question. Thing, you know, you may be doing that, but Al's company is going to be doing something different because he, he may have. Al, Al, do you want to chime in, Al? Yeah. yeah, thanks, Santo. Um, no, good, good question, Roger. I think you know this AI. Uh, well, in our case, uh, we we really we really talk about machine learning. Uh, I think a couple of folks have already mentioned, right? So we do we absolutely do predictive insights, predictive maintenance on the equip on the equipment. We're 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 doing simulations to come up with the best recommendation with regards to optimization. Um, there's a whole bunch of use cases around those two categories, that's not even control, right? So I, I think, Roger, to me, your question, when you're actually controlling the building, to Keith's point a few moments ago, if something goes awry, whoa, hands off, right? Press the eject button, let the control system yeah. just 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 do yeah. its job, right, at that moment. So the, and, yeah. and, and le unless you're in the middle of actually controlling a piece of equipment and something goes wrong, on, and I'm not even sure it's 90-10, Keith. I, I hope it's more uh, like 95-5 or maybe yeah, 99 yeah. It's 99, right? Yeah, I, I hope it is. Th those are the moments where you have to have, you know, a proper exit strategy, if if you will. Um, but to answer your question very literally, I'm, I'm worrying that uh, maybe I'm not as in a sophisticated market as some of my peers here, because... Most of my customers don't really understand the power of just a software application running on top of a BAS and providing some kind of supervisory role and on top of that to do energy optimization. And then I find the majority of my customers, you know, who don't have that deep technical understanding of what software specifically can allow for. Then the subset is even smaller when you start talking about machine learning, because anyway, in my market with my customers, most of my market does not understand machine learning at all for the reason they really don't understand software applications, sophisticated software applications, certainly cloud-based applications as well either. So I, I, I'm, I'm up against, we actually consciously don't use AI as an acronym because there's so much FUD around it in the customers that we talk to that that it's a it's a stress point for them. So if they if they care or they're interested or they got the intellectual ability to even talk about uh, talk about software, we, we'll we'll just stick with with machine learning. And someone asked a question about cybersecurity a, a few minutes ago. But my my mothership company, Mariner Partners, we're a large professional services firm here in in Canada. And Mariner Partners, my mothership, we have a cybersecurity practice. We we offer IT, you know, pen tests and cybersecurity professional services to enterprises all around North America. We understand it very, very, very well. I think one of the earlier questions was, well, the fact that you've got AI or ML in your application, does that change, you know, the cybersecurity around it? Absolutely not. You, it's table stakes. You have to you have to know what you're doing. Obviously, everybody on this call knows that when you're interfacing with these systems. So that that isn't a concern. But as I said, my concern is just this paradigm. The market I'm in, in my opinion, early adopters understand machine learning, but the rest of the uh, the rest of the curve 
there, I, in my opinion, is we've got a long ways to go for them to understand it, let alone appreciate the benefits and, and the power of it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Al. That's very helpful. Um, I think some of you sort of touched on the third bullet here, uh, what described the type of AI. Um, that gets asked a lot. Um, can we just spend a bit of time on that and then we'll spend the rest of our time on the, the smarter stack, which will be, I think, useful. Just sort of quickly, David, how would you describe the type of AI that, that you do? Well, again, we're going down, we're a little bit different than everyone else because we're going down to the actually the controller level and the challenge is putting AI in the device because you have processing and memory limitations. So that creates a different challenge than if I put it out there in the web. So that's why I like when things go out on the cloud because I have tremendous amount more resources to accomplish the task very efficiently. So all of a sudden now when I, when I bottle this up and put it into a controller, I have these limitations of processing memory. Now memory is getting cheaper. We're able to put things in to do that, but that's where we get into, you know, what is it we're going to bottle and put into that graphical programming environment? And um, was Al, I think said, yeah, the, um, yes, most of our customers right are the same way. You talk to them about AI, they go, they just go blank on you. And they, in fact, a lot of them don't want it. Um, so we have to basically, sell it to them in a different perspective as far as reliability and capability. So that when we look at, um, uh, oh, you could say anomaly detection or, or really importantly like occupancy detection, we don't say your occupancy has got AI in it, then they get all upset. But if you say, well, we're giving you a better method of occupancy detection. So that not only do we know there's a person in the room, we can tell you how many people are in the room and how many are coming and going, you know, things like that. So we have to re kind of repackage it so that um, they can accept it. But it's that's the way things are going is that there will be more and more of an AI component in everything that we have and we do so that we can optimize it. And we kind of already have it in a lot of things and we don't know it. When we start collecting data, when we start collecting data, we have it. And we start analyzing that data, we have it. But where it's going is, um, we don't have time to analyze all that data. We have to let those AI systems do it for us and just give us an answer that we can trust and, and be reliable. Because I think a lot of us in this uh, presentation here came about from the industries in the 80s and 90s. And the technology that, that transpired over these last 25, 30 years was a lot. But with AI, that same amount of technology is gonna happen and you can change the numbers, modify it the way you want. It's gonna happen in the next five years with AI. So there's gonna be a rapid acceleration of capability in the next five years. So therefore, now how do you keep up with it? You can't. So you have to make the systems do the work for you so you can spend the time basically to uh, learn more things on what's going on and not get into the nitty gritty because it's more than you can do in five days a week. So that's okay. what we're so, taking is that optimization. So, so with, with respect to the type of AI, you're basically saying, you know, it, that's not really a valid question. It's not really important. That's what I'm hearing you say, which is an interesting question. Uh, what, what, how would you answer the question, Keith? Uh, we're an AI company. I'm not going to shy away from that at all. We're AI. But what, what type of AI, or even, yeah. is, or is that no. question even makes sense? So we're, it, it makes it. There's, we're confusing the implementation or the section of AI that we're talking about. We are an AI company, why? Because we're using AI to replace humans. So humans don't need to be optimizing buildings. They do a horrible job at it. We've had the same problem for a hundred years. We need to get out of that business. So that's why we're an AI company because we're putting, we're automating this process or autonomous, whatever you want to call it. Now, specifically we're using machine learning. Underneath that, we're using reinforcement learning. Underneath that is, is called imitation. And that's my answer. I mean, this is similar to. No, it's good. It's good. This is my. This is similar to my. You know, gateway thing. Like I've been doing gateways for thirty-five years, and everybody knows how big of a bad word gateway is. Like we got, we have companies out there that don't even want to tell the truth. And t a gateway is a, something that converts one protocol to another. I even my people at my my marketing team we call them adapters and connectors. I'm like, no, it's a freaking gateway, and that's what we're gonna call. It. 
So, okay. uh, would you do you have an answer to a type of AI, or again, is is it a stupid question? Well, I don't think it's a stupid question. I think I don't know if someone mentioned ChatGPT here a moment ago, but in again, in the market I'm in, boy, AI is such a broad topic. People have everybody's got a different idea about what it is, which is, as I stated earlier, we, we try and stay away from it. Actually, we, we, we stick, we stick to, to machine learning. And, and when we describe how our machine learning works, uh, we really try to take care, especially again, depending on the sophisticated uh, sophistication of the, of the recipient who's hearing our description, you know, around describing it in physical domain, physics, thermodynamics type of terms. Again, we're, we're providing a solution for chilled water plants. So what do they understand? They understand pumps, they understand pump curves, they understand cooling towers, and you know, they understand, you know, how much uh, energy a, a motor will will consume will will consume. So we describe it, you know, we've got these, you know, physics models, we've got these Gaussian process models, and we have predictive models and we simulate the plant once we've ingested all the data to your point. I didn't mention this on your second question, right? If the instrumentation is poor on this chilled water plant, we may not be able to help you at all, right? If you don't have any digitization around, you know, basic instrumentation. Uh, but our learning strategy, we're, uh, you know, we're we're very much on the on the Bayesian on the Bayesian inference type of modeling that we do. Um, generally speaking, in our opinion, these chilled water plants are relatively small data sets, relatively speaking, in the in the AI sphere. So we Bayesian is is working for us. You know, we use our domain knowledge around uh, around uh, physics and thermodynamics to to build these predictive models. And then a big part for us uh, in terms of the type of learning, uh, we call it, you know, continuous or sequential learning. Basically, once you first connect to these chilled water plants, uh, we collect that data. Our modeling showing, you know, we can we can start making recommendations and optimizations with a couple of weeks of data. We don't need a couple of years of data right now, and uh, and then we quickly adapt around those models. So that's that's a key value prop for us. In that, again, these are physical systems. I know you all understand them, chilled water plants. They degrade after the first day that they're in, right? Things start happening with this equipment. So by using a combination of the original manufacturer's pump curves, as an example, on a motor versus how it's performing today, we can actually do some assessments over and above optimization around predictive maintenance, I think someone mentioned. So that's our approach to ML and to this problem on, on chilled water plants. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Al. All right, last question is, uh, where does your solutions fit on the smarter stack? This is the smarter stack. And what I've done is I've made it so that I can edit it. So we have a, an opportunity here of, um, well, I'm hoping that uh, Rick has sort of made you aware of the, the smarter stack um, by the looks of it, no. So this is a stack uh, that we created um, a couple of years ago, which is really to help us identify and talk about the pieces of a of a solution for smarter buildings, right? And the the whole idea is that we have this. This is not an ISO network type stack. Right? It's really sort of a business stack. It's not, it's not a network technology stack. It's really sort of a, the way you look at the business components that's necessary to make a building smart. So it starts with a purpose, for example, unless you understand the purpose, then why do anything? And then it goes into the operations, who's actually gonna operate it. And then it goes into the delivery, which is how is this smart and information and actionable information delivered to the operation and the people interested in purpose. And then what the apps are, these are obviously, uh, I would expect a lot of the AI things to be uh, part of this line. And then the orchestrate um, layer, which is really how all of the apps and data and pieces uh, meet, uh, um, find each other. So a gateway, for example, is something that would go into the orchestration layer because it's only needed to make a couple of things work with each other. Data is obviously where the data is and systems is all of the systems that's actually in the buildings. 
So these are the systems that are actually controlling the physical the physical um, entities. And one way of thinking about this is that the the two la lower layers of this um, stack is really the most fundamental things that the building that the building needs to, um, to operate on a minute by minute basis. Everything else above it is almost optional. I don't like using that word, but it's it's not actually needed for it to operate on a on a minute by minute basis. So. Um, just because I'm going to cheat, I know that, uh, for example, um, your thing, um, David, sorry, I'm just going to put DK here because your um, AI it's more control is smart. <laughs> yeah. So, so D DK uh, control. I'll just put it in there. Should really make these uh, smaller. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm messing up here. Let's do that. Okay. Um, so that's you. You are you are a system level thing, right? A controller, one of your controllers. Sure. Right. Your um visual programming is really more of an application that does more of the system yeah it's an application yes in itself but it works more at the system level so you're it's allowing you to make those devices that operate that system level and touch the physical things so we always keep diving down you know as opposed to where where the real application where things happen that's the that's the cool place to be is where the application is where a lot of other people are right now is the application but, but your, things happen and control. But your your solution is not an application. That's a development environment. Yeah, ours is just a development okay, environment. So. It's not an application environment like some of the other okay. people on this call. So I, I don't really want to say we're an app because we're just a development environment. Okay. So Keith, would you like to just sort of say where you think your pieces fit? Um, all across the board, smart pieces. Okay, from, so from the data acquisition through through the delivery at the top. So those this, four. This data layer is the data storage and management. It's not the data acquisition. Uh, where does that so, exist? Like what the, is the it? Ac the acquisition will be what it does to southbound to the systems. So I get the systems. So the data. This is where the data. If, if you have an IDL, this is where it sits. If you probably do. So that is that in our SQL database then? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's where it starts. That's the foundation of it because we ingest all the disparate di systems into the SQL database. And your actual your actual logic is up in is is an app, in, right? In cloud. Yeah. yeah, in cloud. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And oh, you also have a gateway, which is correct. Which really should be in here. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'll say facil gateway. And minor detail. We're we're kind of like lowercase f. It's kind of like Facebook, <laughs> if you don't mind. Lowercase f. Yeah, yeah. It's like Facebook, right? It's our brand, but yeah. Like millennials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Al. Yeah, I. You know, we. Uh... For sure, we're an app in the in the yellow part of the rainbow. Um, we do do uh, some data, and I'd say manage orchestration down below. But we have a partner, IOTech, that we're that we work with for their gateway. So although we do do some of the colors integration in the bottom part, I'll call it your rainbow here. Uh, the real, the real. Uh, objective for us though is to for a shift anyways to stay in the top half of the top half of the rainbow so from a delivery operations perspective so our software surely fits squarely in that yellow in that yellow bar but when we do delivery again for chilled water plants um if depending on the customer they may want to just relinquish control here hand over the keys you guys optimize it you guys run your analysis around predictive maintenance and let us know what's going on 
Other customers, though, no, you know what? We've got operators, human beings who are managing this plant. You just give us the recommendations and we need you to, uh, you know, act, uh, you know, give them the recommendations. So we have, I would call it man in the middle or man in the loop. So depending on on the customer need, when you get up to operations and, and what they're looking for and what kind of analysis they are, exactly, they uh, they may choose that. Okay. I'm just fixing my errors here. But <laughs> so this one is actually different. This was David. So it's a bit of a stack. This is like L stack. This is um, uh, Keith stack. And this is David. <laughs> is there know, anything else that needs to be on here? So the, the systems that you, um, that you typically deal with, Obviously not your not your systems, Keith. I mean they are they are whatever. Um, in some cases they are for uh, fast food restaurants, for example. That's uh, our eView IoT system, which is Tracy Markey's product. So in some case, okay. in, in, but in that case only, yeah, Anto. It's it's pretty much, yeah, mostly it's the existing BAS, it's okay. the existing legacy BAS. But for QSR, okay. it's part of the system okay. will be cost as well. Yep. I guess it brings us to the purpose, Anto. You know, why why is all this being done? Yep. Thank you, Roger. So I'm not sure that there's actually a different purpose between these three necessarily. I'm not sure that that yeah. necessarily helps. I think the outcome is increased right. efficiency. Optimization. Yeah, and if I could just add, I, th I think there's another category I would call it stability and reliability as well, just day-to-day -day operations, um, which I find in our market, sometimes those are two different people who are worrying about one, an energy manager's, you know, trying to save money on a month-to-month -month basis, but the operations guy is interested, but that's not what's waking him up in the morning. He wants to make sure his plants being run is reliable and, and stable. Well, that, that's precisely it, Al. Um, I'm I'm one of our prop tech customers, Rising Realty. They've got a data center with two different. He wants to get rid of the variability. Like he's got Wednesday peak setting peak that comes in and you know it's swing shifted 24 hour operation. He's like our best time of operation shouldn't be when I'm at when during the day when I'm when the boss is there and then it waits for the graveyard shift and he wants he wants he wants to eliminate all that variability he wants consistency it's not necessarily um energy savings at all like not right. so just let's spend a, a minute on operations consistency then I think is the word I'm looking for yeah consistency I'll just add that as another one In terms of operation, what, what, how would you? Um, who, who actually, who actually, who actually does something with your service in a building? Who actually actions anything? Who's actually pulling the knobs or pulling the levers? Well, it's kind of behind the scenes. So, I guess, I mean, we interface typically with the director of facilities, I would say, slash energy manager. But they were just probably the same. Not, not a lot of button pushing or lever pulling with our system. Like, they, yeah, we right. so, the, the facility manager doesn't want to touch the system. They just want to know it works and it does the job and they're so done. They don't they, want to deal with it on a daily basis. Who do we interface with? Who's our customer? We, well, we meet monthly with the uh, procurement people and the and the CFOs and stuff. Those kind of the finance people. That's who it ultimately comes down to. The reason that's who we're actually meeting with on a regular basis is you know how's the system performing? How much energy did we save? How comfortable are my buildings? That's the thing. It's the business. So it's basically it's it's a check in more than yes. yeah. on a monthly so... business. Yeah. So I've just put that here. I mean, the whole idea, I mean, this is kind of interesting because we're talking about AI. Right? And the whole idea of applying AI is actually to minimize the 
manual operation. So duh. Absolutely, absolutely. Like we're we're okay. we're we're going over the results with our customer and the benefits and the ROI and stuff like that. So ideally, there shouldn't be an operations layer if everything's all automated. Ideally, right. That should be <laughs> that should be the AI application. Yeah. Interesting. I think we're. I I think it's true what you said, Anto. But I, I in my opinion, we're we're a few years away from that. I, I have two personas. I think I'm aligning with Keith here that I that I work with and that we sell to and that we support from a customer success perspective for sure. The energy persona, the energy manager, he wants all the things that Keith just mentioned. Right? How much did I save? Show me the ROI. Are we still on track? Talk to me about M and V. All, all that piece, you know, in terms of, and chilled water plant against electricity and water, of course. But the facility manager, very key stakeholder for us. And, uh, you know, they're thinking about the stability of their plant day to day. If our AI is doing its proper job, we're telling them things that they were not aware of before because we can complement their instrumentation with some of the modeling that we do from an operations perspective day to day, that's interesting to them. And then from a prediction and, and insight perspective, right? They're worrying about operational budgets. They're worried about the, the emergency budgets. Um, and then there, there's a third category, you know, I would call it just for a facility manager, you know, core, you know, business case, what if scenario analysis. So you built me this digital twin. Hmm, what if I put VFDs on some of these motors? What's the ROI look like that, right? What if I change my refrigerant and my chiller plant to a different type? Hmm, what does the ROI look like on that? So I, I think there's a category or a bucket under each, uh, whether it's an energy focus cost finance person or whether it's an operations facility manager person well, those are str strategic goals for their business you know yeah. we're helping their business run better yeah I'll, I'll raise up a good point because that's where i mean fundamentally a building is going to lose energy and we always we know this from way back that um the energy efficiency of the building is the materials you put into it so what's going on i think with both keith and al i like what we're doing here is because it allows us to understand what is the physics that build it that allows a second generation to come about, a second phase of that building to say, now, how do we optimize what's going on? Such as, well, let's go to a VFD system. Do we do we put in windows, shades? What do we do with the air circulation, air quality? What does that mean? So it allows us to create that model, that twin, however you want to look, however you want to do it. But then allows it to go to that second phase of now, let's optimize what's going on there. Because now we understand what we have. Now let's go in there and modify it as opposed to it's a building from scratch where you know, you put these things into it, but that's where it starts. The materials and how the building's constructed is where it starts. Unfortunately, 99% of our buildings are, there it is, make mm -hmm. it make it more efficient, make it better, all those things. And I think that's where we are, all of us. Okay, we are way over time. Um, ben, um, I, I know that this has been you've been what, keenly sort of waiting for this. Uh, can I ask you to spend 30 seconds to Recap what we learned here today. You're muted. There's a lot of approaches to uh, to how we apply AI, although there is some commonality, which was good. Um, it was great to hear the banter between. Uh, I think I think we have to continue continue doing this to come you know to draw good resources out of it. Uh, a lot, I think, is just people sharing their opinions. I think it's very interesting that the some of the observations about uh, how we jump over silos and how uh, the interoperability problem might be, I wouldn't want to say so bold to say solved, but uh, reduced greatly with AI. And uh, that's kind of an interesting concept that came out. So I think it's still early days. We all need to keep talking. I think uh, sessions like this are are good. Let's let's keep at it. We've got a whole month to uh, to to explore a whole bunch of areas. Back to you, Anto. Yeah, uh, yeah. We're going to continue this next week as well. We we set up the side two two weeks to have a conversation with vendors. So uh, we're going to continue this next week. Um, you guys have more to say. Come back next week and hopefully yeah. we'll have slightly I, different questions, but uh, we'll have other people as well joining. So 
Yeah. I think this is a really important conversation because um, we're all trying to figure out exactly. I think we all know what the pieces are, but we're not quite sure how it all comes together. And that's what well, I think it's I think it's safe to say to wrap up that I mean this is not science fiction, right? Like mm -hmm. I've got pay I've got paying customers. Like this is a multi billion dollar industry, um, you know, coming soon. Um, it's ramping up very quickly. So yeah, this is here. It's here and it's here to stay. Like we're engaged. Like this is not science fiction. Cool. So let's wrap up the show for today. Thank you, Al. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you, uh, Keith, uh, for joining us. Thanks, everyone else. Thank you. Um, and we'll get a video out for tomorrow or thereabouts. And hope you have a great week. And we survived the solar eclipse. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> the sun is back. The sun is back. All right. All right. Bye, Al. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.